Well, welcome to my presentation about cyborgs. Um, there are many different definitions about cyborgs, and I will present you some of them. So let's start with this one. A cyborg is a self-regulating organism that combines the natural and artificial together in one system. Cyborgs do not have to be part human. For any organism system that mixes the evolved and the made, the living and the inanimate is technically a cyborg. This is a definition created by Chris Hables Gray. He published it in the book Cyborg Citizen. He claims that everything that combines the natural and artificial is a cyborg. So I have a question for you. How many of you have had a vaccination? Yeah, I think even everyone. Well, according to Gray's definition, a vaccine turns you into a cyborg because it is synthetical. So how many of you would call themselves a cyborg? <laughs> yeah, for me, that's also going a bit too bulk. So therefore, I have another definition. It says that a fictional or hypothetical person whose physical abilities are extended beyond normal human limitations by mechanical elements built into the body. That's a cyborg. And this is stated by the Oxford Dictionary. I wouldn't restrict this definition to fictional or hypothetical people because they actually already exist. There is also a bit a more medical definition, which is this one. An organism, often a human, that has certain physiological processes enhanced or controlled by mechanical or electronic devices, especially when they are integrated with the nervous system. But I think this with the nervous system goes a bit too far. And I will show you some examples later. So the first example of a cyborg is probably one that you all agree with me that we need it. I'm talking of medical devices, like, for example, a cardiac pacemaker. They are important. They enable people to be alive when they actually couldn't be alive otherwise. But maybe I can also tell you of some risks about it. In an episode of the TV series Homeland, one of the characters is assassinated by a terrorist who hacks into his internet-enabled heart pacemaker and accelerates his heartbeat, heartbeat until he has a heart attack. Is this just fiction? Well, not everyone thinks so. In 2007, Vice President Dick Cheney's cardiologist disabled the wireless functionality of his pacemaker because of just that risk. Next, next, I want to present you the very first officially recognized cyborg, Neil Harbison. He is colorblind. He sees, therefore, he sees only in gray colors. And I will show you a video where he explains how technology could improve his life. Uh, in 2003, I started a project with computer scientist Adam Montandon, and the result, with further collaborations with Peter Keshe from Slovenia and Matthias Lisana from Barcelona, is this uh, electronic eye. It's a color sensor that detects the color frequency in front of me and sends this frequency to a chip installed at the back of my head and I hear the color in front of me through the bone, through bone conduction. So for example, if I have, if I have like This is the sound of purple. For example, this is the sound of grass. This is red, like dead. This is the sound of a dirty sock, like, which is like yellow, this one. So I've been hearing color all the time for eight years, since 2004. So I find it completely normal now to hear color all the time. Um, at start, though, I had to memorize the, the names you give for each color, so I had to memorize the notes, but after some time, all this information became a perception. I didn't have to think about the notes, and after some time, this perception became a feeling. I started to have favorite colors, and I started to dream in color. So uh, when I started to dream in color is when I felt that the software and my brain had united, because... In my dreams, it was my brain creating electronic sounds. It wasn't the software. So 
That's when I started to feel like a cyborg. It's when I started to feel that the cybernetic device was no longer a device. It, w it had become a part of my body, an extension of my senses. And after some time, it even became a part of my official image. Um, yeah. So he really feels like a cyborg and that this technology is a part of himself. Next, I want to present you <laughs> present you this guy. This is Rob Spence. And he has a wireless device in his eye. He had an accident when he was nine. And now he is a filmmaker. He can film everything with his eye. He says that for people who want to go to war zones, as for example, a journalist, it would be much safer to have a bionic eye instead of a big camera. He has a known web page where you can look at his videos. But as far as I think, it doesn't contain any videos made by his eye camera. I didn't know if this is maybe because of legality issues, that it would interfere into the privacy of the other people. I'm not quite sure. So let's get a bit crazier. What about microchip implants? Do they already exist? Yes, of course. Many pets have chips in order to get recognized when they are lost and found by random people. But they also exist for humans. In the early 2000s, Applied Digital Solutions in Florida began experimenting with implanting their chips into ordinary people. I want to talk a bit more about microchips because I think they are another category of cyborg devices. The other ones gave people with disabilities the chance to have a normal life. But microchips kind of upgrade the life of even ordinary people. For example, you wouldn't have to bring your passport when traveling. The microchip would provide your ID. Every year, about 28,000 babies get mixed up in hospitals, leaving with the wrong parents. Also there, a microchip could provide identity. Imagine opening your door only with a hand wave. There would be no need of a free hand to open the door. And also paying at the store, all done without wallet or keys. This even gives you the security of not losing them or having them stolen. Furthermore, kids couldn't easily be kidnapped anymore since the microchip could be tracked. And also other people who forget where they live could easily be brought home. But that's not all yet. Imagine you wouldn't have to see your doctor every time you feel unwell. The microchip could measure your health data and your doctor could look at your data at any time from far away and give you advice on what to do. Or maybe it would even get crazier and the doctor is not even needed anymore. A smart device could read your data and help you right away. In 2012, some scientists even found a way how to use a microchip to detect cancer. This is an easy and cheap way to detect cancer also in very early stages. But of course, there are also disadvantages. We don't know yet what long-term long side effects these chips have on our body, but also on the society. A microchip cannot prevent minor crimes, like speeding. Um, also, allowing companies to scan your chip for identification will give them control of your data, like, for example, the place where you are, so you could always be tracked. And of course, there could be bugs or the device could be hacked, giving away all of your data. Especially health insurances would probably be interested in getting health data of patients. Furthermore, it could be that every company has its own microchip. I mean, already nowadays, it is difficult to get a standard. You have a separate card for everything, like one for the library, one for the gym, and it could basically be the same with microchips. And, least, and last but not least, some medical treatments wouldn't be possible anymore. For example, would a microchip lead to an incompatibility with strong magnets like on our MRIs? I have already talked a bit about the stakeholders of this topic. First of all, we have the disabled people who want to have a better life quality and when possible also achieve a device that enables that. Cyborg devices can improve senses and give a better chance of surviving with bad heart conditions. They can also improve the mood and lower the rate of depression of disabled people who can, thanks to the devices, have a normal life again. 
Then we have the companies producing the cyborg devices. I would say most of them are probably interested in getting profit out of it. Therefore, such devices are very expensive. Furthermore, the electronic parts have physical limitations and cannot heal by themselves. Maybe they have to be replaced after some time, making it even more expensive and also dangerous since every operation has its risks. As I already stated, there are also companies interested in data. Health insurance companies, for example, would definitely want to get the data to know when someone has a higher risk of getting sick and therefore increase the prices of this person. And of course, there are also the ordinary people. Most of them will probably just want to have a nice and convenient life, as well as being safe. But already nowadays, we can see that if some people have a new device, soon everyone has to have it. There are some companies where everything works over Facebook. You can barely get information about them otherwise. So will everyone need to have implants in future? What will happen to the people who cannot afford to buy them? Will it lead to racism and discrimination? In most cases, when people get power, they abuse it. Will it be the same in this case? Will humans become a lower race species compared to cyborgs? I don't know. Well, before I end, I want to get a bit more hypothetical. Um, Ray Kurzweil is director of engineering at Google, as well as author and futurist. He claims that humans need a body, but that it is not, that it is not restricted to a biological one. In this video, he tells about his vision of the future. Well, we're going to become increasingly non-biological to the point where the non-biological part predominates and the biological part is not that important anymore. In fact, the non-biological part, the machine part, will be so powerful it can completely model and understand the biological part. So even if that biological part went away, it wouldn't make any difference because the, the non-biological part already understood it completely. We'll also have non-biological bodies we can create bodies with nanotechnology. We can create virtual bodies in virtual reality. That the virtual reality will be as realistic as real reality. The virtual bodies will be as detailed and convincing as real bodies. Um, we'll have different. We'll have different ways we can create bodies. We do need a body. Our intelligence is directed towards a body, but it doesn't have to be this frail biological body that's subject to all kinds of failure modes. Well, I think we'll have a choice of bodies. We'll certainly be routinely changing uh, our apparent body in virtual reality. So today you can have a different body in something like Second Life, but it's just a picture on the screen. Although uh, research has shown that people actually uh, begin to subjectively identify with their avatar. Uh, but in the future, it's not going to be a little picture in a virtual environment you're looking at it'll feel like this is your body and you're in that environment and that your body is is some is is a virtu is the virtual body and it can be as realistic as real reality and the environment yeah so i don't know what you think about it if you agree that virtual bodies and virtual reality could become our future but before we discuss that i would like to show you a trailer of a video game it plays in a dystopian world with the cyborg as a main character. Maybe I've already heard of it. If you try and rip the world apart, someone will always put it back together. You can kill dreams. You can kill innocence. You can kill freedom. But you can't kill progress.
So now I'm curious to hear if you would like to become partially a machine and what you think of Cybrix. Thank you. <laughs>